Hi, I'm Spencer Ziegler. Hi, I'm Melissa Smith, and welcome to Data Lit, a podcast for educators by educators. So listeners, welcome back to our continued discussion around street data, which is based on the book with the same name, Street Data, a Next Generation Model for Equity, Pedagogy, and School Transformation. That is written by Shane Safir and Dr. Jamila Dugan. So in part one, we mostly introduce a three-level model for looking at data. So Spencer, would you remind our listeners about those three levels? Sure, sure. So the, the kind of topmost level with a wide, wide lens is the satellite data. So that's really useful to illuminate patterns of achievement, equity. Um, it gives you a sense of the general direction. This could be like our EOGs, EOCs, grad rates, SAT, ACT, the kind of data that allows for norm reference, which gives us that uh, really useful ability to kind of compare um, at a macro level, but it doesn't tell you everything. So the next level down would be map data, and you can kind of view it like we talked about last episode, like you're kind of zooming in a little bit more. You're on Google Earth, you're zooming down, so now you can start to see maybe like the neighborhoods. So map data like NC check-ins or universal screeners and diagnostics are our district surveys. I think you make an argument. So everybody's getting kind of the same one that can fall in here. Um, it'd be really useful for kind of identifying gaps, be it for students, you know, uh, their, their skills or with the standards or even instructional gaps for teachers. Um, so it starts to get more focus. It can, it can tell us the what, but it doesn't really fully tell us the, the why. why. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So for the why, you really need that street data. Um, and there's a quote I like in the book. It says, uh, street data is the qualitative and experiential data that emerges at eye level and on lower frequencies when we train our brains to discern it. Mm-hmm. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So this can be like localized surveys. It can be focus groups. It can be walkthroughs. Uh, Melissa, in the last episode, used the phrase I, I liked, um, going beyond the dashboard. You know, it's trying to figure out if we want to understand who it is we're we're trying to connect with, be it students, staff, parents, um, what are their experiences, what are their their mindsets, their misconceptions. You know, it can help us figure out the internalization of what we're trying to do. Um, but doing so requires kind of focused and systematic listening. Um, so that that I think that's what we're going to talk about today, right? Yeah. So I'm glad you brought up listening. I kind of highlighted that every time I've seen the book because they talk about this listening data. And since reading the book, I've been trying to figure out how do we capture what is listening data that sounds so unique and yet complex at the same time. So how do we capture that? And so in this episode, we'd like to discuss what street data looks like at that school level. And to that end, Spence and I would like to welcome our guest. Uh, Sarah Stevens from our district leadership team because of her proximity to the work in schools. So Sarah, welcome. Thank you. So Sarah, tell us briefly about your role in the district. Sure. Um, My official title is Senior Administrator for the Northern Area. Um, So I work closely with Chris McCabe, our Northern Area Superintendent, to support his 23 schools Mm -hmm. around using data, leveraging data to drive school improvement and just, you know, do a little bit better tomorrow than we did today Mm -hmm. um, as we think about serving our our students. I've also um, had a really unique opportunity to serve as an intern with the Office of Equity. Yeah, so I've been really involved in, in the work of developing our equity framework and and have just been really honored to be a part of that team, too. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and I think those two lens makes you kind of an invaluable resource for thinking about what street data looks like. Um, So what do you think? What does the street data approach look like for our classroom teachers? Sure. You know, I'll say I'm a teacher at heart, so that's immediately go back to my own classroom experiences. I think The essence of it to me is, and this comes straight from the book, is that you're continually assessing how you're doing as a teacher by going directly to your students, your families, and using that deep listening that you just mentioned Mm -hmm. and observations and and student work to kind of help define success for your classroom. Yeah, all of those are my favorite words. (laughs) Yeah, it it sounds it sounds so obvious when you put it that way. If we're meant to be serving students and we should check in with students, but oftentimes I think that can get lost just with all the complexities that is our schools. 
Certainly. I think one of the things in the book that they brought up, and you know, it's so interesting in education because you have newer books and they'll bring up an idea and you're like, yep, love it. But it's not like a brand new idea. Yeah. And so in the book, it talks a lot about how do we highlight voice? Mm-hmm. And again, that, you know, this street date is about highlighting voice, student voice, mm-hmm. teacher voice, and how if we can tap into that what can that do when we're looking to transform schools and classrooms? And so, again, getting that, that voice, yeah. I think, you know, again, street data is about, again, understanding the people, the human beings behind the numbers that we see. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Part of the work with developing the equity framework, the Office of Equity, they did focus groups with students. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Yeah. And and out of the 10 themes that emerged from the DEI assessment, so they did focus groups with students, with families, the community, a wide range of our stakeholders. And one of the 10 equity focused practices that, that emerged was centering student voice. So this is directly in line with some of our new practices that we're working to embed in our schools. Yeah, and I appreciate, you know, the, just the systematic approach, because if I think back to my time in the classroom, I might say that, you know, Oh, yeah, yeah, that was something I did. I, I kind of, you know, checked in with my students, but I didn't necessarily do it, I think, in a systematic way, but that, you know, the focus groups or the DEI assessment, whereas mine was probably just kind of my gut and my gut has biases. So if you don't approach it in a systematic way, um, there might be people that are left out or, or even just my memory has gaps in it, you know, so uh, you need to do it intentionally. Absolutely. I think you you bring up another really uh, important point about what this looks like in the classroom or as a classroom teacher. And that's, you know, they they talk about the equity traps or the equity tropes. Yeah. But for me, what I think it really comes down to is like maintaining and keeping sight on like your day to day actions and how Mm -hmm. those either send the message to your students that their voice matters or that, you know, it might not. So like I was thinking about an interaction I've observed in classrooms when a teacher's circulating and they notice that, you know, a student has incorrectly utilized like a foundational skill or a, a skill that's been taught prior to that day. How that teacher responds in that moment can either convey to them, I see you, I believe in you, and like I want to know why this might have been challenging. Yeah. Or, you know, it can also convey the opposite. And I think it's those little day-to-day interactions. It's not just this, oh, now I need to go do empathy interviews every month. You know, it's a little bit of both. So it's that systematic, but it's also that just way of being in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And that's a good reminder. Like, I can always think back to that time when I approached a teacher about not understanding something and she told me that I'd never get math. Now, I don't think she meant that. <laughs> you know, I don't think she meant that like in a really bad way. I mean, I think she was frustrated, you know, just the time when I look back. But at that moment, I didn't want to go back to school. Yeah. And I always start my classes telling my students that story that here I am as a math teacher when I was once told that I'd never be able to do math or I'd be good at math. And so, again, to know that you can... The power is within you. I say that story to my students to let them know the power is within you and don't let anybody else define what you can and cannot do. And so it's always so interesting as a teacher, I try to remind myself, how did it feel in that moment? Mm. And not that I haven't had those moments or had frustration, but again, that intentionality we keep talking about and just trying to stay focused in what is it that goal we're trying to accomplish and always reminding our students that, you know, they're seen, they're heard and they're valued because we know what that feels like as students to be seen and heard and valued. Hmm. Yeah. And that's a good example. Like if that was me, that probably would have crushed me. And uh, my, my, the work that I would have put into that classroom would have dropped off. And then when you looked at the map data or satellite data, it would have told you that like, oh, He's just not understanding the concepts when the root cause would have been something that you would have only been able to figure out if you looked at the street level. If you had a conversation with the person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I I was recently in a classroom and had observed two students have an entire conversation about why the student had gotten something wrong. So he'd already both students had worked through that reflection process. And because the teacher was, you know, trying to quickly move from from group to group. 
she didn't realize that that conversation had been had. And so the way in which we engage students in that conversation, hey, I noticed that this was incorrect. Like, tell me what you were thinking. That opens up the opportunity for the student to say, yeah, I just realized that. And if I had done this and this, I would have gotten it correct. Mm. And think about the power of being able to say how, you know, where you made your mistake for that student and how much deeper that learning um, will go. Yeah. Yeah. That example makes me think of what are some other examples or ways educators or classroom teachers can collect street data to improve their practice or instruction? Mm. So um, in the book, they provide a really great chart that kind of breaks it down into artifacts and then stories or narratives and observations. Um, I really appreciated just kind of that I'm a I'm a bucket thinker. So, like, yeah. <laughs> you know, if you can break something into buckets, it sticks for me better. So, you know, artifacts are those things that the students might be creating that kind of show you um, or demonstrate to you as the teacher how they're doing or what they've learned. Right. Those stories um, that can come in the form of empathy interviews, journals that you write between you and a student. It's not listed here, but it, it made me think of as a classroom teacher, and I would never recommend doing this alone, but I used to do home visits. And that was incredibly powerful for me as a classroom teacher, just because of the dynamic it created between me and the student and the family. Right. And to hear, you know, just how they operated as individuals and as a family unit from their perspective was was huge because then I could lean into that in the classroom. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, So just, you know, any kind of opportunity to to get stories from students. Mm -hmm. This this also makes me think of have you guys read uh, Chris Emden's um, for white folks who teach in the hood? I have not. So I've heard it's pretty powerful. Yeah. Uh, So he talks about this idea of what he calls a a co-generative dialogue, but it's really, to me, it sounds like in essence, like a a lunch bunch or a lunch group where students actually get the opportunity to say what's working well and what's not working well in my classroom. Mm. Um, So just leveraging some of those non-academic times um, to get input from them. The book also talked about, you know, like if, like I said, we're in a, in a day where we may not be able to do home visits like I remembered, you know, when I first started teaching. But they also talked about like talking to a bus driver. And I was just like, yeah, you know, I've had interactions with kids. And if I had ever thought about speaking to the bus driver for that kid and asking, hey, what have you noticed? What have you seen? Like they have some information that can help me better understand a student that I would never even think about or that what's happening in the cafeteria. So talking to the cafeteria workers, like, you know, there's so many people that as a classroom teacher, I have access to, but I'm, if I'm only thinking student or parent, there's so many other people that those students interact with that have information that yeah. might, you know, again, help me understand the human being that's sitting in front of me. Yeah. And it, it, it strikes me as I hear this, just that the um, collecting street data has value on two levels. Mm-hmm. One, just the data that you're getting that can inform your instruction and help you to, to make better connections, all that kind of stuff. But also just the process of gathering the data is... Uh, visible, tangible proof that you care yes, and that you yes. see them as a human being, mm-hmm. even apart from the data that you then use to modify how you're going to apply, uh, you know, think of you know, how to teach them how to divide fractions or something. Right. So just the process of collecting it is beneficial. Yeah. What okay. examples do you have? Um, we didn't speak to the observations, but that kind of bucket, but one that I think is really powerful if you have the opportunity and perhaps it happens while, you know, your students go to an elective or is just shadowing a student to see, you know, observing what the experience is like for other, you know, for students outside of your classroom within the building. I think that's a, you know, just one example of observations that would give you street data. Yeah, they the book mentioned that I had thought about what that might look like to shadow a student just to get a different perspective. Because I know here in DRA, there was one time I think we tried to do kind of like on paper what it might be like for a, uh, a student who was um, 
was not proficient in their EOGs and sort of track back, well, okay, you know, if you give them like an NKT, what happens? If you give them M class, what happens? And you're seeing how many testing. So we were looking kind of like how many tests did the student experience, which is very different because it kind of gives like, oh, this student is getting a lot of tests, retests, and some of it is giving you sort of the same information. But I was like, I wonder what it would look like, not just on an assessment paper sort of thing, but again, to have the lived experience of what it is like for a student like that. Like if you're going to every class and every class has some sort of assessment and that is constantly telling you, you're not good, you're not good, you're not good. I wonder at the end of the day, what does that feel like? Like, how do you pick yourself up and come up? Oh, I'm ready for another day of learning. Like, you know, like what is the, what does that feel like for students and how can we as classroom teachers sort of step back and reflect. I know the book was pretty big on, we need to get back to uh, reflection. Yeah. Not just as educators, but encouraging our students to to reflect. Again, you know, asking them these questions, giving them that opportunity to sort of reflect on their day, on their learning, and then sharing that uh, with us. You know, if we we have those dialogues, what that might look like, Mm -hmm. the power of those dialogues. And I wouldn't be me if I didn't, use this as an opportunity to plug a digital portfolios as a potential <laughs> way for students to tell their story yeah, and yeah. also to reflect in a really systematic way to track their growth and, and be more than just the, the numerical uh, piece of data tied to them. And I think I like to, when you do digital uh, portfolios and you talk about them, I've seen you talk about them, that it's not just please put all of your perfections in this place. Because yeah. I think that feels like a barrier to some folks. Oh, I can only put the things that I'm good at. But to kind of show that learning, right? That's what the portfolio is. It is, a, here's where I started and here's where I ended and here are the things that I learned. So it's a space where you can talk about the good, the bad, the messy, you know, all that, all those yeah. parts. Then as a teacher, when you're looking at those portfolios and reading those reflections, that street data that you can say like, oh, I noticed this, maybe I should change this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so this all sounds great, but what might be some of the challenges or, or considerations uh, when using this approach? Sure. There are definitely going to be challenges. The authors speak a lot to the fact that this can be messy. Yeah. yeah. Um, they use that word quite a bit um, just because, you know, when you get primary source information, you know, you have to take a moment to process it. And then that kind of leads me to the the probably the hardest part is that it also requires us as educators to be vulnerable. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's really, really hard. I think it, I think our society makes it even more difficult. And this, this era in which we define success by test scores and we know our students need to get, you know, to a certain point makes it even more difficult for us to take a step back and kind of, you know, devote some time to this, this type of data mm-hmm. and collecting this data. But I think if you really lean into that vulnerability, it just opens up more opportunities yeah. for relationships with kids, right? And and families and your peers and anyone you have a relationship with in your life. But um, I think, you know, that and then just knowing that we all have implicit biases and they are going to come into play. There's a really great resource that I think we talked about linking in the show notes from the Office of Equity that includes like critical reflection questions. Oh, yeah. So as you're kind of processing street data, it's really important to stop and pause and think like, what do I believe about this? How might this be challenging my assumptions? Just taking those moments to actually reflect on that and ensure that those implicit biases are not uh, getting in the way of, of real, truly listening and, and hearing what you need to hear. Yeah, I agree. I, I did, the the theme of the willingness to check oneself, right, yeah. uh, came up a lot while I was reading the book to the point where I'd be like, I'd have to stop because, you know, they would say something and it sort of ruffled and like, yeah. And, you know, you'd have to stop. And it's like, oh, I mean, this is a lot of reflection. And one of the things they talked about in the vulnerability is being vulnerable as a learner and being she, being willing to share with my students that I too am learning, mm-hmm. ooh, that's a big one for me. And I have practiced some of that when I was in the classroom. And I remember the first time I tried it, one of my students said, well, that doesn't even make any sense because if you're the teacher, you're supposed to know <laughs> <laughs> more than this. So how can you be yeah. learning? He says, you know, and I was just like, well, here's the thing. I'm not learning math. 
I'm learning how you learn math. That's where we are in the yeah. difference, right? You're learning math. I'm not necessarily learning math, but I'm learning how you learn math. So both of us are coming at this where we have some challenges and we're both learners in this space. So, yeah. you know, that and the book sort of raised some of that again, you know, that vulnerability. Again, just being able to have that conversation with my, my class, with my students and build that put me on a different pathway to be able to really see, because again, it was a constant struggle. Like, okay, I taught this. I know it. Yeah. How come they can't get it? Right. And having to like step back and be like, all right, all right, let me see. Let me try to really, really understand what is it that they're understanding. And then sharing that with them is like, Hey, you know why I'm asking you this? Cause I really want to understand how you're coming at it. Cause I definitely can sense you're not coming at it the same way I'm coming at it. So I need to, for, for me to help you, I need to kind of, better understand where you're coming from. Yeah, I like that, that, that introspection. I wonder sometimes if there's a, a feedback loop with, with yeah. education and teachers and that um, this generalization doesn't apply to everyone, but sure. by and large, you wonder if like the people that become teachers are people for whom the system worked and that's, you know, why they get into it, you know, to um, work for me, therefore you kind of go back into it. it I think it takes um, some deep, vulnerability and introspection to think about changing um, and disrupting a system, um, even though that system may have benefited you. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think we've we've talked a lot about how this the street data gives you feedback as a teacher to adjust for instruction. But I also want to lift up the positive feedback that comes from oh, yeah. collecting oh, yeah, street yeah, data. Yeah. Right. I'm sure we all have that story of the student who you interact with for months and then you one day realize like how much you had an impact on them. Right. And it just comes as a surprise um, out of nowhere. And it's, you know, it's that street data that when you open up those opportunities, if I had, you know, opened that opportunity to that particular student sooner, I might've known that sooner. Right. You know, and, and how, how beneficial that is as a teacher to know, Oh, like this thing that I'm doing well is, is really making a difference. I need to keep doing it. That's a great point. Yeah. uh, Cause there have been studies about how like uh, the memory we, we cling to negative interactions, remember that more so than positive ones. And you need like, that's what we talked about, like with relationships, you need a three to one ratio between positive interactions and negative. uh, Otherwise remember. Um, And I think that teaching can be a thankless job, and it's probably easy to have a distorted memory of how it went if you're just going by your gut, where if you actually collect data, maybe you realize, oh, I'm connecting, that went better than I thought, and so on and so forth. So I like that. I didn't thought yeah. of that. Yeah. So what kind of support might teachers need when implementing an approach like street data? I think having some thought partners, co- yeah. like collected, oh, wow. you know, um, collaborative peers that you can lean into and and just kind of think through the data with are are critical, right? Like equity work is hard, mm-hmm. and and so we need we need that support. I also think it would be really helpful and and important to share with your administrators um, that you're, you know, you leaning into this approach um, because their support will be invaluable too. Um, And, you know, the more people you share it with, the more likely others are, are to use it as well. I think a minute ago, I mentioned the critical reflection questions. I think that's a great resource, but I think the number one support is just having a community. Yeah. A community um, to, to kind of, work through this with. Yeah, I agree. Because this is definitely not work. Where there, While there is work for you to do individually, you can't just do it by yourself, right? Yeah. The book of itself seems to be a book about relationships. And if we are going to do this work, education is about relationships with a lot of, of, of different people. And so you definitely need a community to do this. Otherwise, you're just going to just bury yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think for, for that kind of moral support, but also maybe even the data collection, maybe like an IF or administrator can come and just kind of chart some things that they, they notice with the very specific problem practice in terms of interactions, who you're checking with, what does that look like, what does it sound like? Yeah, absolutely. I think overall the book is about building that community, right? And today we've talked a lot about what the, it looks like for the classroom teacher, but I think the author's ultimate goal is for us to build schools that improve. Or transform. I love that yeah. word. Yeah, transform. transform. Yeah. yeah, transform <laughs> through this, you know, through you, the use of street data. Yes. Okay. So um, 
So what's one, as you're reading the book, what's one kind of takeaway that's kind of lingering with you, Sarah? It's hard to just pick one. <laughs> and I'm hoping just you don't throw some core name conjunctions. You know, you can, you can connect a few. I'm hoping none of you choose mine, so let's see. <laughs> um, I think the idea of just using this data to make students' experience visible mm, yeah. is, is what sticks with me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because we we only know our own lived experience. Yeah. And the most impactful way for me of building my own critical consciousness and examining my own, you know, how I either support or um or perpetuate inequities in our systems is by is by building relationships and learning more about others' lived experiences. So I think for me that's that's kind of the thing that hits home. Okay. Spencer, what about you? you? You can you can go next. No, Make sure I don't steal no. yours. Okay, <laughs> you go All right. next. <laughs> you sure? Uh-huh. Might be your quote. Uh, I really <laughs> liked coming from the the data research and the accountability department. I love the line: uh, "Data can be humanizing. Data can be liberating. Data can be healing." Um, I wouldn't necessarily think that's. I think if we took a poll, those wouldn't be words. If we did like that, that pop up in like a word cloud that people are going to associate with data. Um, but I think that if you approach these relationships from a intentional and systematic way that the data can be humanizing, liberating, and healing. Okay. All right. You didn't steal (laughs) mine. All right. What do you have? So the one that stuck with me, again, because you got me scared when you said data research and accountability, (laughs) because we're always looking for metrics to um, measure our strategic goal. And when I read it here, it, 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 it shifted me a little bit. And it says, if we accept that success can be defined by a metric, if we hold true that a child's test scores or grade point average are determinants of her future, we will find ourselves forever suspended in a hamster wheel, mm. chasing external solutions, curricula, and validation. But if we believe that every student is more than a number or a trauma story, is in fact a complex, layered human being with endless potential, brilliance, and access to community cultural wealth, we can choose a pedagogy of voice that transforms everything from our classrooms to our adult cultures and to our policies. Oh, that's good. I like that one. (laughs) Because it was, to me, there was a call to action Mm -hmm. to redefine success. And that's what threw me off because we're so used to defining success by these numerical things, right? Our grad rates and stuff. And this seemed to me to be a call to action for what would that look different if we had to redefine success. Mm. And I've been, ever since I've read it, I've been trying to figure mm. out what would that look like? How, how could we do that? Because we've done this for so long. And again, to me, this is about a radical approach to trying something different. What would it look like if we had to redefine success mm. to more than just the typical metrics? So I'll leave you all on that one. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So before we sign off, I want to thank our guest, Sarah Stevens, for sharing her expertise with us. Even though we have just scratched the surface of the work needed to be done to transform schools, we encourage you, our listeners, to find one thing that you might consider for deeper reflection. Mm -hmm. Thanks to Roseville Middle School's Jamal Wellman for the theme music. If you have questions, comments, or further notes, you can reach us at www dot wcpss.net forward slash data lit and until next time goodbye take care bye